welcome back. We will continue the program of the second international symposium on food science, SINCA, with the lecture entitled Application of Probiotics for the Production of Functional Food, which will be given by Dr. Maria, Maria Florencia Zacarias. Dr. Maria Florencia Zacarias is an assistant researcher at the Food Technology Institute of National Scientific and Technical Research Council in Santa Fe, Argentina. She has experience in food bi microbiology and functional foods, working mainly on topics related to incorporation of probiotic microorganisms to obtain functional foods and study of technological and potential probiotic characterization of bifidobacteria. Dr. Maria Florencia Zacarias, on behalf of the organizing committee of the second international symposium on food science, we appreciate your availability to give this lecture with a topic of great interest in your area. Professor, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. Obrigada pelo convite. Eu não vou fazer a apresentação em portunhol, mas se vocês têm dúvidas depois, pode, pode fazer em espanhol ou português, eu acho que vou compreender. So uh, we're going to start, just uh, let me see, to share the screen, okay. So can you see it, please? Just tell me. It's okay? Yeah, it's okay. We can see it. Okay. 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 So for starters, I think it's important to try to define what are functional foods, so then we can move on with probiotics and how are they related. So um, functional foods, maybe they were first defined uh, around in the 80s in Japan, and they were defined as a special kind of food called fo foshu or foods for specified health use. But if we go uh, way before that, already in the beginning of the 20th centuries, we had uh, Elie Mechnikov publishing an article where, uh, where he talked about the health benefits of fermented milk. So in that work, we already started seeing what are functional foods and these health benefits, benefits that they can um, give us uh, to consumers. So there is no uh, a one definition of functional foods. There are several that are accepted, but I think this simplify one that says that functional foods are foods that may provide health benefits beyond basic nutrition is a good one for starters. So uh, we can add to foods different like ingredients and make them more functional. And we have like antioxidants or polyunsaturated fat acids or prebiotics, but vitamins. And we also can add probiotics to foods. And that's what uh, we are focusing today. So probiotics foods are um, a really important group inside functional foods. And I think it's always nice to, to have we are not doing it today, but I always like to have this uh, talk with uh, students or with the public to ask what is the first word to com that comes to mind when we talk about probiotics, because maybe most of you have heard of them, you consume probiotic products, but maybe there are some people that are not that aware of the, the subject. So there are always like words that are coming when we talk about probiotics. Sorry that this slide is in Spanish, but I think you can understand. And people's, people always say like fermentation, fermented foods, health, of course, uh, yogurt, safety, uh, microbiota. There, these are some of the terms that people uh, used to share when I ask what they think when, when I ask what are probiotics. But there is a consensus on this definition and it's one that was already established by the World Health uh, Organization in 2001 and one was then uh, confirmed but I, but, uh, by a panel of experts, sorry, uh, related to the field of probiotics. And this definition says that probiotics are live microorganisms that, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. So I always like to pinpoint at this point, and is at, at least the one thing that I want for people to remember about probiotics is that they are alive. They are live microorganisms. So they are not substances. They are not drugs in the sense of th that they are uh, ingredient uh, inanimate. They are uh, live microorganisms. So this is a really uh, good but challenging topic when we talk about food. Yes. 
So uh, if we look more closer to this definition and to all the words that uh, are part of this definition, we can establish that there are really uh, different aspects that we need to have in mind. Because, of course, if we are talking about microorganisms, we're talking about microbiological aspects. But we are also saying that they have to be live and they have to be in an in an adequate amount, in a dose that is necessary. So when we talk about that, we are talking about technological aspects. It's not easy to have a living bacteria or yeast in a food, okay? And last but not least, we have what is the main point of probiotics. We have to have a health benefit. So when we talk about this, we are talking about all the functional aspects related to probiotics. And the three of them, are necessary when we talk about functional foods. So let's start with the microbiolo microbiological side of probiotics. And here I think you may be familiar with these two. These are like the two groups more important when we talk about probiotics because they are the more widely used in probiotic products in the market. And also we have more evidence about the benefits in the scientific field, let's say. We have a lot of evidence of the health benefits of these two. So uh, the genus Lactobacillus, it used to be a big genus, but now it has been divided in 25 different uh, genera. So just to be more simplified, I will keep talking about Lactobacillus, but you need to know that nowadays we have like 20 different, uh, different genus when we talk about them. And they are just rods, they are gram-positive bacteria. The main product of their metabolism is lactic acid, that's why they form part of this group of lactic acid bacteria. And two things that are important from the technological point of view is that they have tolerance to oxygen. And the temperature for the growing sometimes can be uh, mesophilic or thermophilic, so that's also uh, good, those are good features to use them in products. But when we talk about bifidobacteria, these are another group, totally different from lactobacilli. They are also like gram positive, but uh, if you look at them under the microscope, they are not like perfect rocks. They have like these irregular shapes and they belong to the Actinomycetaceae family. And the particularity of these bifidobacteria is that they are obligate anaerobes, even if some species have uh, some tolerance to oxygen and those are especially the ones that are used in probiotic products. And another feature of this uh, bifidobacteria that is also important uh, for the technological use of them is that uh, the product of the metabolism is not just lactic acid, but also acetic acid. So that is, um, that is important because uh, you know this vinegar smell that uh, that we all know, okay, so when bifidobacteria are growing, they, they produce these kind of compounds. So that can be not so good uh, from the point of view the, of the sensory characteristic of some foods. So th this is just so you have an idea, but just the important thing is that bifidobacteria and lactobacillus uh, are the main probiotic microorganisms. But we also have uh, other, other probiotics and I like to present you to Bacillus because um, they have the particularity of that they are spore forming and they have a high resistance to pH and to different temperatures. So sometimes it's not easy to add, for example, like the Electobacillus uh, to a determinate product, but Bacillus, they are really resistant. So it's easier to add them maybe to a, some chocolate bar or to cereal bars, for example. And we also have a yeast that is really famous and is Saccharomyces boulardii. I first heard of it in Brazil. So you have, in Brazil, you have groups that work or used to work with Saccharomyces boulardii and they have really interesting results, uh, especially it's a probiotic that is really effective in the prevention and treatment of diarrhea. And there's a lot of clinical evidence of their, uh, its beneficial effects. So it's a really good probiotic also. And last, I would like just to introduce what is called now next generation probiotics. And we uh, became, uh, we get the, the knowledge of these probiotics 
while studying microbiota and all the genomics studies of microbiota. And they were discovered because sometimes you see um, some correlations between the composition of healthy microbiota and the presence of determinate species. Or sometimes you see that people who has a, uh, a disorder, maybe uh, Crohn disease or metabolic syndrome, and when you look at their microbiota, there is uh, less abundance of some bacteria, for example, Akkermansia mucinifila or Fecalibacterium prasunitsi. So these two really got the attention of, uh, of scien scientists to study as probiotics, and they are both being studied right now. The problem, or I would say the challenge with next generation probiotics is that uh, differently from the others I mentioned before, the other ones have been used for decades or almost century. Um, so they are considered by the regulatory um, offices, both in Europe or the US or in the world in general, they are considered a safe microorganisms because they have been consumed by the humans for longer years and there's no uh, evidence that they can be dangerous. So that's the difference with this next Gen probiotics because uh, we, we don't have data about safety. So now the safety of these two, for example, is being uh, really studied at the moment, but they, 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 there are some results uh, already in the use of both of them and they, they are really promising. So let's hope we can use them in the future. So Keeping, uh, continuing a little bit with these microbiological aspects of probiotics, and I promise we are almost finishing, just to have in mind that some of these uh, microorganisms have really complex nutritional requirements. Uh, I already mentioned they can be anaerobes or they can have uh, some problems with temperatures or with pH. So uh, it's always important to, to know how to grow these microorganisms and to grow them sometimes can also uh, have an impact on the price of the products that use these probiotics. And how do we control these probiotics in food? Is uh, we do it uh, through viability, through, through counts on agar plates. That's the routine methodology, let's say, in microbiology. And it's important both for processing all um, the control of the processing stages in the food production, but also it has an importance on the regulatory side of things. Because when we talk about probiotics, we always need to check that it's in the right amount, I said it, in the adequate amount that is necessary for the beneficial effect. So usually the recommended dose of probiotics in foods is higher than 10 to the 6 uh, CFU per gram or per milliliter, but of course this depends on the studies for specific uh, probiotic. There's another methodology that sometimes we can use that is flow cytometry and it allows to have results in real time because the problem with uh, viability counts is that sometimes they take days until we have the results and so flow cytometry is a good option but it doesn't replace uh, the, agar, the agar counts. That's uh, what I wanted to mention about the microbiological aspects. Sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. But let's look at the technological aspects that I think it is more, maybe more interesting for you because of the profile of, of your uh, postgrad careers. So we find probiotics in which kind of products? We have traditionally put probiotics in dairy products. So fermented milks are the more common ones. And I checked which ones you have in Brazil, you have a really big market of probiotics, I think much bigger than in Argentina. So you have like Yakult or other kinds of fermented milks. And, uh, but you can also put probiotics in cheese or infant formulas. Um, I think infant formulas is really interesting because at least for me, because I work with a uh, bacteria, bifidobacteria from breast milk and it's, 
uh, really interesting to, to know that breast milk contains these kind of bacteria that are uh, beneficial for babies who breastfed. But when kids cannot have breast milk, it's really good to be able to add this kind of microorganism in the infant formula. So that is a good application of probiotics in a, a food product. And also in last years, we have uh, probiotics also in ice cream, for example. And this is a really big challenge from the technological point of view. So I will talk uh, a, bit, uh, a bit more later on. But in all these kinds of products, usually we find uh, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, as I mentioned before. Nowadays, we have uh, the market of probiotics products is expanding. And we not only have dairy products, but we also have uh, foods based on cereals. We have peanut butters with probiotics. We have chocolate bars. We have smoothies or fruit juices. And we have also meat products with probiotics. I just mentioned here some of the species that you can find in them. And of course, we also have like food supplements uh, with probiotics, but I will not uh, fix on them today. But just I just check it. You have also a lot of probiotics with uh, proved efficacy in, in Brazil. So you have, for example, Floratil with Saccharomyces boulardii, or you have LGG or Enterogermina. It has a bacillus that also has a lot of proven effects. Now, when we talk about um, the incorporation of probiotics in foods and all the processes that uh, are necessary to get probiotics there, we need to start with the fermentation and the biomass production of probiotics and to produce a big concentration of cells. And then they will be uh, concentrated and put in a format of frozen pellets, let's say, but also cultures can be dehydrated and then they will be storage until the moment that they are gonna be used for the production of probiotic foods. So uh, what is the best way of uh, use probiotics and to add them to foods? We have frozen pellets, I already mentioned, and they are used mostly in the production of maybe fermented milks. But I would say that the star is the hydrated cultures and particularly the freeze drying because when we have we, we need to think that we need to transport these cultures and for industries and the cost of temperature, for example, to keep a frozen uh, culture and the space that you need for to, for storage for these kind of cultures is really impacting on the price of the product. So freeze drying products are really stable and in the long way is, is cheaper and easier to, to manage than frozen cultures, but both are being used. So I don't want to be repetitive, but okay. So th that's what I was saying. Freeze dry uh, cultures are really good for se heat sensitive materials. And also what is important for food formulation is that they are easy to rehydrate. So uh, to add them as ingredient in some formulation is really, is really good. There are some other strategies to dehydrate probiotics. One is uh, spray drying and there's a lot of publications related to their use I've seen for producing probiotic cheese or uh, juice even and fermented milks. The spray drying technology is an available technology. Industries have it because uh, skin milk powder is produced with, with it. And it's a quick and economical technology, especially comparing with freeze drying. But the thing is that uh, it's not good for heat sensitive materials and some bacteria and some probiotics are sensitive to heat. So sometimes this technology is not uh, appropriate for probiotics. And at least to the best of my knowledge, I don't think industries are using uh, spray dry cultures nowadays. There is another strategy that is microencapsulation that sometimes involves spray drying, but not necessarily. And this is a way of protecting cells. But the problem with this microencapsulation can be that uh, sometimes you need to modify the, the processes steps to get to your food because of these microencapsulated probiotics. So maybe it's complicated, let's say. 
from the practical point of view, and also it has a uh, high cost. So for now, freeze drying is really the, the best strategy, and I say is used widely in the whole world for, for producing cultures for use in food industry. When we have these uh, cultures used for food application, we don't have just the culture, but we also add some protections or some uh, other comp components to help to protect the cells, especially in the dehydration process, but also during the storage, because we need to think that these microorganisms are going to be added to food and they are going to be in the shelf until the moment that they are consumed. And so they need to be stable and to retain their, their concentration along this shell life. So all these aspects are also important in the, in the formulation of food. And also when we think about, um, this is talking more from a personal point of view, when we try to study this in the laboratory, sometimes we forget that everything that we do afterwards had to be scaled up to a pilot and finally to industrial scale. So sometimes there are some alternatives that we see a lab scale, but we need to always keep in mind this scaling up. And during all this processing, I think the main thing that I would like for you to have in mind is that here we always uh, need to, to be reminded that the viability of the probiotic is important and also to keep the functionality during this processing and during the shell life of probiotics. So it's really, it's a really challenge to have this in mind. I put here, uh, this is from a publication from a Brazilian group from this year. It's about the production of uh, a functional ice cream, a probiotic ice cream. And I thought it was a good summary of everything I've been just mentioning because they put step by step um, what you have to have in mind, the challenges, the hurdles that you have to incorporate probiotics for in a food like this ice cream. Yes. So you have to check first the compatibility of your probiotic with the raw material that you're going to use in your food and with all the ingredients that you're going to incorporate. Because sometimes you have maybe some fruits or some juices that can be really acid and they can have an impact, for example, in probiotics or not. Maybe they can help and uh, improve the survival of the probiotic. Then you have also to see which is the most suitable additional addition form, sorry. So this that we were talking, is better to use a frozen culture, is better to use a freeze dry culture, or maybe the option of the micro encapsulated culture. It's been used in ice creams, particularly micro encapsulated probiotics have been used in industry. I mean, not, not just in the lab, but there are some products that have micro encapsulated probiotics. But it's, it's a good alternative, it's cost efficient, let's say. And also you, you have to check that the probiotic is gonna stay stable in all these uh, processes and during the production of the food and during the storage. So you have to check that the resistance is okay and that you, you have your probiotic in the adequate amount. So it was a nice summary of all the things that you need to take and to have in mind when you want to, to produce a functional food with the addition of probiotics. And I was just saying, so sometimes the, the process can affect not just viability, but also functionality. So the question is, every time that we put a probiotic in a food, we need to check is like, it would be really heavy to do it because imagine that, for example, you produce apple juice with probiotic and so you make all your studies with that product, but then you decide to add to this apple juice some, I don't know, some calcium, for example. Do you have to check again about the functionality of your probiotic? Well, this is always in discussion uh, and also depends on the regulatory system of the country where these foods are being produced. But let's say that there are some tests that you can do to check at least in a quick way, maybe some in vitro tests that you can do to check that functionality is still there. 
And in vivo tests, I wouldn't say so much, maybe if there is a big change in the, in the production. But it's accepted. And I was also checking, um, because you have here in Brazil, you have uh, Ambisa and you have a, a regulatory really new about how um, probiotics are regulated, sorry. And I think this is really explain how, how much evidence you need to, to provide to be accepted and to, to be able to use the probiotic in determinate food, let's say. And let's go to the last part of probiotics and the functional aspects of these functional foods. And when we talk about this, we talk about the health benefit. How do we study this health benefit? We always go from the easiest kind of trials and then we go up the ladder. So we start with some in vitro tests. The main one, I would say, to screen uh, probiotics and to screen them on a food is to test the resistance to the stimulated gastric digestion. You need to know if that probiotic is going to support the low pH of the, of the stomach or the uh, bile salts that is going to find when it goes from the moment you eat it until the moment it gets to, to your intestine, let's say. But there are also other tests that you can do, like you can check like the antagonistic capacity of if they are able to produce some specific metabolites like extra um, exopolysaccharides or prebiotics, for example, if they can use prebiotics. And once you have your results in vitro, you go to the test in vivo in animals, or also you can do tests in cul uh, cell cultures, sorry. And then you will check intestinal function if, to see if impact, for example, motility in the intestine, or also how is the immunomodulation at the level of the gut, and also the protection against maybe some specific pathogen like salmonella or maybe the, the protection against some disorder, okay? And always at the end of the tunnel, and this only reach those probiotics that are really uh, promising on their effects are the randomized control trials in humans. So this is always the end or the, the final step that probiotics need to, to overcome to be able to say that they have really health benefits. So which ones are the reported benefits to health that we have nowadays for probiotics? There's one that is really common and is the improving of lactose tolerance. And that's really a special one because it's not as the rest of them. We, when we talk about the beneficial effects of probiotics, we talk usually of strain specific effects. So you need to say that, okay, the probiotic Lactobacillus rhamnosus shishi, for example, that is the name of a strain, has this health benefit. You cannot say all Lactobacillus rhamnosus have this or that effect. But in the case of improving lactose tolerance, this is a characteristic that all um, starters for yogurts, for example, uh, have this capacity because they all um, have this lactase enzyme that has this effect. So it's normally uh, approved to say that all the Lactobacillus bulgaricus and the Streptococcus thermophilus that are part of uh, yogurt starters, they have this beneficial effect. But all the other beneficial effects are strain specific. And they are, for example, modulating immunity, uh, control of gastrointestinal infections, prevention or treatment of some kinds of diarrheas, alleviation of uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome symptoms, or also at levels different from uh, gastrointestinal tract, like can be the respiratory tract or the vaginal uh, system. I'm not gonna <laughs> talk about specific mechanisms or probiotics, but I will just say that uh, we all always have to have in mind that probiotics are consumed and they reach the intestine. So they are going to play with the cells of the intestine, but also with all the microbials that are forming the microbiota. So it's really a complex ecosystem. There are some mechanisms that are uh, shared by some bacteria, for example, like maybe you can say that 
all lactobacilli have some mechanism in common or all bifidobacteria have another one, but uh, not always is the case for that. And I just mentioned the microbiota because always when we talk about probiotics and when we talk about food, is always microbiota related. And microbiota is really special because we have different taxonomies in different microbiotas. I'm not talking just about gut, although when we talk about food, this is the main one that we pay attention. But I just mentioned before about the uh, some vaginal infections. We have probiotics for that use and also microbiota in that place is totally different, for example, or also microbiota in the skin and probiotics that can be used for that. But when we go um, to the gut microbiota, even if it's in the same site, there are no two people who have the same composition in microbiota. So it's really hard uh, to normalize or to say that there is a model of healthy microbiota. Of course, there are some uh, core microorganisms and enzymes and compositions that can be considered like a healthy composition. And when that is not there, we talk about dysbiosis, but it's not, um, it's not something that can be like summarized in, in a model composition, let's say. And there are a great number of factors that can affect microbiota and they also will have an impact in, in the benefit or in the interaction of the probiotics with the microbiota. So, our my, microbiota can be defined by genetics, but also uh, diet plays a, a, a role there and smoking or the use of antibiotics. And also the if you are obese or you have overweight, that also have an impact on your microbiota. So that will also like have a, or may, may affect how the probiotic uh, plays a, a, their functional characteristics in the consumer, let's say. So uh, I just mentioned a lot of things from all the points of view, from microbiological to technological to functional. And every country or every, let's say, the European Union has regulations, the US has regulations, Brazil has regulations. So in the last years has been presented a, a document to try to standardize at least a minimum criteria for which microorganisms should be considered probiotics. And these are just some of the, the main points that uh, were presented to the Codex Alimentarius that uh, is used worldwide. So this is being studied, it's not accepted yet, but they are really simple stipulations. First, that probiotics need, need to be identified to the strain level and they have to have a name according to international nomenclature, let's say. They have to be safe, and this is important, especially for next generation probiotics. Also, talking about sufficient levels of the probiotic uh, to deliver that health benefit. This needs to be really uh, stipulated in the product, and that uh, amount, that concentration of, of probiotics need to be stable until the end of the shelf life of the product. Also, these cultures need to be deposited in international cultural collections so everyone can have access and further study. And at last, what I said before, the health benefit needs to be proved in human intervention studies and done properly, let's say, with good design. So this, this has been presented to the Codex, I think in 2019 or something like that. And I don't know with the pandemic, with COVID, what happened with this, but is it's still being under stipulation. And here in Brazil, you have a guide for, for the um, approval of or not of probiotics. That's what I find on the internet. So all these things that I just mentioned, you have them in this um, kind of summary of things that people who works with probiotics, with food, with probiotics, they need to present. So you have it already regulated in Brazil. And I read and I was really surprised that you have already health claims approved for at least two probiotics that I could find. One is Bifidobacterium lactis and HNO19. And the other one is Abacillus 
Pahulans, I think, is another product, is Canadian. So it's a really interesting because I think in Europe or in the United States, uh, there's no health claims approved for probiotics yet. So it's really a big step for, for Brazil to have this approved, I think. This was just a summary of what I've been mentioning. I think it, it got too long. And just this, like a final comment that I mentioned these uh, human trials that are really important for the beneficial effects of probiotic to have evidence of their beneficial effects is really important, but it's also really important to translate all this information so the doctors and the health practitioners maybe sometimes can recommend for us, okay, you can use this probiotic as a help for you, as an adjuvant for your treatment or something like that. And for that end, uh, we have what is called clinical guidelines that are uh, big tables constructed by people, uh, experts on probiotics, and they translate, let's say, the information on, on the papers, on the journals, they translate it to these tables, so health professionals can check and see what evidence is for each probiotic. So this is just uh, an example. This is from the World Gastroenterology Organization, so it's the biggest organization in the world that makes these clinical guidelines, and it's really interesting because you can check, for example, for uh, antibiotic-associated diarrhea, you want to check, okay, Saccharomyces boulardii has a uh, evidence level of one, so there's a lot of evidence, and they they consider that is uh, is the highest level for for recommendation of probiotics. And that is everything. So just for you to have clear, there's a lot a lot of functional foods containing probiotics, and the numbers are growing. And it's good that now it's not just dairy probiotic products, but also we have a lot of plant-based probiotic products coming. And just to keep in mind that it's always uh, good just to base our decisions on evidence and not sometimes in fake news or information that is in, in common media. And that's everything. Obrigada. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Maria Florencia Zacarias, uh, for the outstanding lecture. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few questions here for you on the live chat. Um, Professor Mariana Roselino asks, what type of food do you think would be promising for adding probiotics in the future? Well, I, I was saying, I, I think it, it was good news when we started seeing more plant-based uh, products for, because from the technological point of view sometimes to add a probiotic in a fruit juice or smoothie or those kind of products can be difficult because uh, you have to have in mind the low pH and also sometimes the shell life is so short of this kind of product that, that maybe to add probiotics to that for a product that maybe the shelf life is so short it's not it's not so good from the economical point of view for for producer but i think more and more people are daring and there are also these like more small companies that are trying to produce this and also it's important to know that um related to this to these products that are not dairy the producers of probiotics the ones that everyone uses for producing fruit uh, are usually produced by large companies international large companies like I don't want to do publicity, but Christian Hansen, DuPont, I mean, they are really big companies in the world. And they used to have all these cultures like base for dairy products. So the base of these ferments was uh, dairy products. And now they have a new battery of cultures, of starters of probiotic cultures for vegan products or for plant-based products. So they are free of any animal, let's say, uh, component. So it's really good because it opens the, the chances of for us to play or to try to, to formulate new, new products. So I think that's really interesting. She also asks, asks and do you think in fermented or unfermented foods? So that's I, I didn't touch the matter of fermented foods because it's it really is it's a total different kind of uh, dissertation. But I love fermented foods and I work now with fermented foods. But it's important to differentiate because uh, sometimes people 
in the everyday life, when they talk of probiotics or they talk about fermented, they talk like they are the same. And that's what um, at least people who we, that we work in the more scientific field, let's say, we like to separate, not that one is better than the other, but probiotics, you know which or which microorganisms are in that product. I mean, you have the name and the last name. I mean, you know it's Lactobacillus rhamnosus, Bifidobacterium lactis, and the name of the strain. Instead, in fermented foods, you can have uh, the same kind of microorganisms. You can have Lactobacillus rhamnosus or Plantarum or whatever, but you don't know the identity of that uh, microorganism. And you can have a, a lot of microorganisms. So they are good, but they are not the same at least from the scientific point of view, okay? okay. But do eat fermented foods, they are good. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question here from André Luis Sabac. He asks, you talked about the challenge of increasing the shelf life of these products. Mm -hmm. What are the existing strategies and trends? Okay, so um, there are strategies for probiotic cultures, and then you have strategies for food products, let's say. So, but um, I think the goal, and that's why I think microencapsulation, even if it's not um, so cost efficient, maybe, is being used. And I, I had to check because I was not sure if industrial products have, uh, for example, microencapsulated probiotics. And I found some examples. In, in Ireland, they have this uh, fruit juice, and there are also examples of uh, ice creams with probiotics. And when you see the, the graphs, they compare like uh, the survival of the probiotic, if they are free on a fruit juice, for example, or if they have it microencapsulated, of course, it really makes the difference and they are more stable and they don't affect so much the flavor maybe sometimes of the product. So it's a it's a valid strategy it's just that you have always it's not just one thing you have to have the full picture in mind and when we talk about probiotics and survival an interesting strategy to try to um, make them more resistant is to induce some different kinds of stress on probiotics so maybe you do a shock of temperature for example or with ph also and that makes the cells more resistant. Sometimes they can acquire a better resistance than for the process of food. And that's also being studied. Yeah. So we have another one here from Livia Ribeiro. And she mm -hmm. asks, does genetics affect the nature of the gut microbiota to the point that it is something to be studied, used in nutrigenomics? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm not expert on microbiota, and that's really that's a really different matter. But I think uh, the problem with microbiota there is a genetic component because um, there are studies comparing sometimes uh, microbiota, and there are some studies also using like twins brothers, so they can see differences. You know, it's trying to have the more similar model to people with similar genetics, let's say, and see the impact and stuff. But uh, I would say that uh, factors that are also uh, really heavy or have an impact on, on the effect of probiotics related to microbiota. And one is the diet, of course, and also these, um, well, all the cultural differences that are related to what we eat and our lifestyle also affect microbiota. And we have another one from Professor Mariana Roselino. She asks, can you talk a little bit about paraprobiotics and postbiotics? Okay, so uh, it's interesting. Uh, for example, today I mentioned uh, Acarmancia municifila, and it's one of these uh, next-gen probiotics. And I said that because of uh, safety issues, maybe today you cannot use it as live microorganisms. But a good strategy that is being used is to inactivate these microorganisms. And there are uh, evidence that shows that even inactivated, these uh, 
strain, a strain of these species has really interesting uh, beneficial effects, even inactivated. So that is really good because if because of safety measures, we cannot use the live microorganisms, we could use the inactivated one. But being inactivated, it no longer uh, can be called a probiotic because by definition, that's not possible. So we have this other category of postbiotics and um, postbiotics are comprised of, uh, well, it can, there can be inactivated microorganisms and also they can be the metabolites of probiotics or of, of microorganisms that have a proven uh, health benefit. So that's another category, but it's really uh, interesting. And paraprobiotics, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, is, I don't, I'm not sure if maybe it's the same as postbiotics. I am not familiar with it. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. So thank you, Dr. Maria Florencia Zacarias. Once again, on behalf of the organizing committee of the second international symposium on food science, we thank you for your availability and for the brilliant presentation made. It was a very interesting topic and a great contribution to everyone present here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much. So, uh, então, nesse momento, faremos uma breve pausa e retornaremos através da outra transmissão já disponível no canal do YouTube com a palestra da doutora Elvira de Merria, intitulada O papel das proteínas e peptídeos da soja na saúde. Então, até breve.